Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hey, what's going on, automotive world? Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping, and I'll be your host once again for this week's episode Joining me on the show this week, I've got Matt Fonslow, Matthew Skundrich, and Brian Pollock. We're going to be talking about billing for diagnostic work. Of course, uh, this is talked about a lot in our space, how, you know, diagnostic work is undervalued in a lot of ways, uh, whether you look at it from the customer perspective or even the shop owner perspective perspective at times, uh, you know, it's easier to make money hanging parts than it is to do diagnostic work. Why is that? And can diagnostic work be as profitable or more than the parts repair side of this industry? Those are the sort of things that we're going to be talking about in this episode. And we're going to take the perspective of brick and mortar shop operation and mobile diagnostic programming. Me and Skundrich obviously do the mobile. Brian and Matt are in a brick and mortar, so we share our perspectives there. We'll cover that in a whole lot more for you, including how you can ship 20 pounds of snow to somebody. But with that all out of the way, let's jump into the episode. All right. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a whole group here again. Uh, Matthew Scundrich, Matt Fonzo, because he whined so much about not being on my podcast, I figured I'd let him on this week. At least and, I did it on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian Pollock, I said your last name correctly, Brian. Close. Yep. Very good. Okay. Awesome. Very good. Yep. So, welcome, gentlemen. How we doing? Pretty good. A little chilly I'm out excited. here. I made it through the day. Me too. Barely. I didn't blow up any cars today. That's a bonus. Nice. Yeah, I can't say that. Sorry. Oh. Nice, nice. I'm gonna. Yeah. I think I'm gonna try to by the end of the week. I think I'm. Uh, I think I'm gonna roll the dice. I think I'm gonna order this valve body for this Mercedes and just let her eat. We're just gonna see what happens. Really, you're gonna go for it? Whatever. Frick, worst worst case scenario, thing gets on a flatbed, goes to the dealer. Who cares? And then you buy a second valve body because they're like, hey, it's somewhat programmed and now our entry won't work. Yeah, you know what? You got to break it. It's not like the valve body is expensive. That's <laughs> what I would do. I just, I take Keith yeah. Perkins' advice, click it till I brick it. Yeah, baby. <laughs> It'll that, take. that works all funny games until you do what I do and you try to fix your programming laptop in the middle of the day and hit the wrong button. And then next thing you know, you're at home crying because you're rebuilding your programming laptop in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Yeah, I was I, I was very upset that day. I had to call Matt and check on him at like ten o'clock at night. I'm like, I don't know if he's gonna be okay. <laughs> like, what did you break on it? Like, how, so, how did it? <clears throat> I use a partition laptop, like most of us who program all day do. And somehow, I opened up. I use Easy BDC to kind of control the the boot sectors so that they're labeled right and da da da. <clears throat> somehow, I don't know how I did it, but I opened it. And because I had four GM something that day was updating, which it happens all the time. <clears throat> I want to say it was GM because I couldn't use it until it updates. And so I knew I had GM to do. So I left it open on my floorboard of my passenger seat. Well, something fell off and <clears throat> hit my mouse, which then opened my easy BDC. And then when I went to go like close it to make sure nothing would hit it, I hit a button and it wiped out the boot loading system. So inside your hard drive, there's a little sector that is set up for booting and how to boot, right? So mm-hmm. it says like, hey, load this or hey, load this. Hey, there's three part- There's four things of Windows installed, zero. Well, when I wiped it out, it went from four things of Windows to zero. And I tried <laughs> like forever to get it to recover. I even called the company that like makes software. And the guy's like, there's a warning when you hit this button that says don't hit this button without a backup. 
and you clearly hit the button. And I'm like, I didn't get the warning, but yeah, I think I hit that button because I can't boot <laughs> yeah. nothing. Right. So I ran CDP to... probably just cloned that thing right over. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I actually tried um, to get it to clone, but because it was like a two terabyte M2, like trying to read it and write it to another drive, because I have my original hard drive that goes to the laptop, and I'm like, screw it, if I can just load that boot section, it'll then rebuild its own, and I tried to copy it over, and it just got bricked even more, and I was like, screw it, new hard drive, and away I went. Dang. So you gotta load all your software back on there and everything? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll start all over. Like, he was, was up like way really... past his bedtime. Oh yeah, I was up till like 2.30 in the morning, and I got up, got up at like 6 the next day to go to breakfast or something stupid. I called him at like ten thirty or eleven o'clock at night, and he like wasn't even close to going to bed. Yeah, I was like, I got, I almost got Toyota, and I will say this: Honda downloaded in seven minutes. What? What? I was like, no don't come on a podcast and lie. <laughs> no, I was like, apparently ten thirty at night is the time to do Honda because nobody is up, or or maybe Japan's awake at ten thirty at night, so. It, it, they boot their second <laughs> server when Japan's awake? I don't know, but I was thrilled. I didn't try that. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, I was I was thrilled. I so, mean, oh. my my download speed at the house is 520 megabits per second. Show so off. Maybe that helped. I don't think I have that at the pole out front. We still have dial-up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've got mail. <laughs> why do you still have everything on one laptop i i split it up for that reason because if one crashes i'm not completely dead in the water oh oh wait the story gets better sir i have another laptop that is partitioned the exact okay. same as the first except it's like a year older so i don't use it because it's not as light because you know within a year they like changed dimensions of the laptop and it weighs two pounds less carry a new one <laughs> so i i was like oh, oh no big gosh. deal just Pull out the backup, and away I go, except I haven't used my backup in eight months. So everything was out of date. Nothing worked. Mm. <laughs> See, that's the advantage of being big. That two pounds, for me, that's just like another deck chair on the Queen Mary. There's no problem, man. <laughs> like two pounds. <laughs> Who freaking cares? <laughs> right? <laughs> What's the big deal? Two pounds. Are you kidding me right now? I had a two pound breakfast sandwich. What are you talking about? Two what in the world? I don't. <laughs> Poor Matt. I don't even want to say anything. He's so much bigger than I am. I can't reach you through the computer, Matt. I feel like you could. No, don't tell him that. <laughs> don't tell him that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Have you ever seen the ring? It's just like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was you got to do the backwards crab walk though once you come through yeah. the screen. <laughs> I'll be in traction if I turn around and do that. <laughs> we both be doing that creepy for the rest noise. Of the <laughs> yeah. No oh, doubt. Skundrich looks like he drowned. What the heck? <laughs> it did. All right, Matt. You got to tell us. <clears throat> You got to tell us how you're billing, how I'm billing for diagnostic, diagnostic, so we can do a big comparison here and see. All right. So <clears throat> over the past like nine years, I've been mobile. I've changed the way I charge for diagnostics. I used to just be like, oh, 150 bucks, no problem. I'll come out and fix your problem. Then I realized I'm not making any money at 150 dollars. I'll come diagnose your problem. So now I do it by like tests. Um, I don't even use the word diagnose. I tell everybody, hey, I'll come test your car for you because I can't guarantee an answer because you may get to a test that as a mobile person, you can't go any further. Like prime example would be, oh, I do an in, in pressure in cylinder and I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure like there's something wrong with a valve, like the intake valve or something. I'm not taking the motor apart to confirm it. That's their job, right? So um, that's where the shop's going to sell some time and I'm not, but that's how I do it now. And it really came about selling it as a test, mostly from, uh, is it Jim Morton? Morton. Um, I took his misfire diagnostic class or something 
down at Bryn's place, and he talked about these funnels, right? Like, hey, you have these four funnels that can cause a misfire. And he explained that he likes to run big, wide tests to put you in a funnel, and then you stay in that funnel until you get a test that tells you otherwise. And now I, that's how I run all my diagnostics. So if I have a 2015 Chevy 1500 with a misfire, I will run like <laughs> relative compression first, look for TSBs, and confirm the diagnostic data. Maybe, maybe go so far as put a spark checker in if it's real quick and simple. But that'll be like the first hour, right, is to get a funnel to go down, <clears throat> have the data to go down another funnel, and then run tests for that funnel. So let's say in the first hour, I'm like, okay, it's got spark, it's got good compression. Well, now I'm going to hook up my AFIT and test all the injectors. Well, that'd be hour number two. Like, that that would not be in my first hour. But I will say that on most cars now, I tell people it's a minimum of two hours to start because one hour anymore is just not enough. There's there's too much going on in these cars. Um, and if it's like a parasitic draw or it's been to like 19 shops and they've yeah. got a part list where holy mother you should have bought a new car by now i just tell them it's a thousand bucks 500 bucks like depending on the car it could be 500 or a thousand i have a bmw that's got this really weird can issue and all these modules saying they're not getting a signal but yet everything talks and they just randomly throw the code and the guy's like oh we want it fixed i'm like thousand bucks to start like i'm not even gonna care i'm not gonna look at it until you unless you're willing to hand me a thousand bucks because I know, I'm going to be in it three, four hours. It's going to be lots of driving it. And you can't, I've learned I can't lose the money I make doing what I do all day to do a Diag that you're going to make 150 bucks on. Like, there comes a point where if I can hang brakes and make more than use all the knowledge and expensive tooling I own, why are we doing Diag? And that's that's kind of where I'm at with it, and so I've just been charging out the butt for it. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because people pay it; like they'll complain. Don't get me yeah, wrong; like okay. shops are huge at pushing back on it. They're like, "Oh my god, you want three hundred dollars to come look at this hypocrisy?" Eh? Yeah, you want three hundred dollars to come look at this parasitic draw? And I'm like, I I tell shop I am I have got the reputation of being a grade A asshole to shop owners. Um, in my area. What? No and way. I, yeah. <laughs> oh, just really, just shop owners. Come on. Just shop owners. Um, sometimes the tech is, if he's really dumb and doesn't tell me he jumped the car backwards. But the one shop owner, I was like, nope, I'm not a grade eight asshole. I'm a Wagyu level asshole. And you couldn't fix a car and you're calling me and you're going to bitch about the price. Like, come on. And it's funny how if you like explain like you're a shop owner calling for help. And you're complaining about the price? Like, if your customer did this, you'd be like, oh, you're not my customer, you know? And you'd send them down the road. But yet you want me to come out there and spend hours and hours and hours at your shop for basically free? Like, that doesn't that doesn't work out, and I won't be in business. And if I'm not in business, who are you going to call next time it doesn't work? And we have a couple all-tell heroes, as I like to call them now, um, who have shown up in the mobile world where they just go around with their all-tell kit and do ADOS all day well they realize like hey I should do some I have to do diags at the body shop so I'm good at diags and I'm like yeah <clears throat> and then they go around and try to do diags but they'll do it horrible and then I get called in after them all the time so uh, what percentage would you say you're doing uh, diag versus everything else programming I mean, ADOS <clears throat> if you do dollars like ADOS wins right because I can yeah I bill extensively for it, um, but the OE tools kill me in my ADOS fees. So, But if you take time-wise, um, which is to me what really matters because who cares about the dollars and cents, time-wise, I'm probably 40, 60, probably 40% ADOS, 60% doing some electrical diag or some kind of programming or something else. Um, but dollars-wise, it'd probably be 70-30. It'd probably be 70, 30. Um, and, and ADOS is my big winner, but then again, most of the cars nowadays, when you go, it's not just one calibration. It's like, oh, you got, you got this Honda and it got smashed in the left front and got a frame rail. Oh, you're doing the, the seat weight calibration. You're doing the front radar. You're doing the windshield. 
oh, it's got parking sensors and it's a new one. So now you got to now you got to initialize the parking sensor systems. You got the ABS initialized, so it's easier to rack up a decent bill with ADOS and and be in and out quick, especially if you have a decent body shop. Then you know, make that same amount of money in Diag. You're there for all day. Yeah, but then you have the people <laughs> running around trying to lowball you you know doing it with the autel like you're saying because that's i mean if somebody invests in the equipment figure out how to put up the targets and they're in there doing that same thing where it, obviously it's not the same with the diagnostic side of things no and that's just it like <clears throat> i hired my brother because he's really good at building right like he he did construction for a while at Disney, and then he worked at NASA as a welder. And so I hired him, and he's going to help me do ADOS. And I'm like, he's going to be great, right? Like, shit, if you can follow blueprints and build a house, you can do ADOS. It's not like it's rocket science. And um, <clears throat> so he, he's he been getting videos and some ICAR training classes, and he's going somewhere for two weeks to go to another bigger shop. And it's funny because he watched the guy do a Honda from the iCar, you know, because iCar has how to do every calibration almost, or they did at one point. And uh, he's like, man, that's just like following directions. Like, if you can read and follow, this doesn't look too bad. And I'm like, I told you, it's not it's not rocket science. Like, the money and tools, and, and ADOS is just like programming to me. It's easy till it isn't. The first time that right. sucker fails, and you spend four hours going, why did this fail? that's that's when you make your money and it's it's always something stupid simple too like i had a toyota the other day it was a 2022 rav4 hybrid and calibrated the windshield just took the windshield out front radar parking sensors and the blind spot is pretty good hit got it all done no codes no lights cleared all the rob data made it 10 feet down the parking lot Bing! the uh, lane keep light goes from white to orange I'm like, oh, that's not good. LTA malfunction, C dealer. Great. Rescan it for codes of text stream. No codes. Go into ROB data. It says power source ECU. Okay, well, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I guess it's something wrong with the hybrid. So go to the hybrid side. Check that ROB data. There's nothing. Like, no codes. I'm like, well, this makes no sense. How can you How can you set a power source code if there's no code for the power source? And what it really ended up being was I did a hard reset just to clear it because who knows and then after i did that i had a code for steering implausibility only in rob data and i tried to reset the rack learn didn't fix it drove it around the block didn't fix it disconnected the battery again just for giggles put it back on redid the power steering learn oh now it's happy and, and it's not complaining but without the factory tool going into ROB data, I don't know if I ever would have gotten to it or fixed it because I don't know if Altel pulls ROB data yet. What does ROB stand for? <clears throat> no idea. It's uh-huh. like it's it's like a code feature where it stores faults. So like when the radar is not programmed, it'll say like radar not aimed, and it puts a timestamp on it. Huh. If Ooh. the radar is dirty. It'll put a timestamp like radar block due to dirt, and it and it writes a code, and so you can pull up the history of all the times this radar has failed or something else has failed, and and they tell you in the ADOS procedures like after you're done with this, you must go in and clear all the ROB data out of like these 17 modules. It takes you longer to clear the ROB data sometimes out of these newer cars than it does to actually do the calibration. I hmm. mean. I'm not talking setup measure, but from hitting the button and going, hey, I'm done, to, oh, let me go into these 12 modules and clear out all the ROB. So, yeah, it becomes an interesting diagnostic world, and that's why I charge more for some of my ADOS is because I get those calls like, hey, we had another guy. He was out here. He couldn't do it. Can you do it? Sure. I go in and look at ROB data, and another one that you want to watch out for on the newer Toyotas is some of the blind spots won't tell you they're not calibrated. Put the lights on, and you'll go into ROB data, and it'll say, on the opposite side, it'll tell you, like, blind spot module B, axis incorrect. And you're like, well, why doesn't it set a real code, right? Like, in the trouble tree, there's a fault code for that, but the module doesn't set it. But it's in the ROB data. I mean, it's, it's, it's just dumb. Like, I'm just... Hmm. 
So that's my random ADOS rant. But that's why, like, I feel <laughs> diagnostics is so important to charge for. Because that's how I learned this stuff, right? Like, I was the Diag ADOS guy for a couple people. So, so I think that, um, I think there definitely has to be a spot where we go from charging. I think too many people feel like they got to go to the end of the earth for their first initial diagnostic fee. I see that a ton. I see guys with like seats ripped out of car. Like there's only an hour sold on the ticket and they got like the driver's seat out of the car. And I think what happens, I think what happens is a lot of times they're not confident in their testing. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Say, say I have a problem on a, you name it, whatever car that's got a fuel pump that's accessed under the back seat, right? So we know that the wiring comes from somewhere in the engine compartment from the, you know, IPDM or whatever it is on whatever car you're working on, goes through the car to the back seat, powers up the fuel pump, right? And we make a measurement with a multimeter, you know, we do a little research on our code, we figure out we got no fuel pressure, we do a little research, we get in there and we're 45 minutes in, let's just say we're 45 minutes in and we, okay, we have a six volt drop on fuel pump power from where it left the relay box to where we're at under the back seat. And I think people are so inconfident in their testing, they can't just be like, all right, there's your first hour, that's your your issue. You've got a six volt drop and then, you know, pick the labor time of the biggest pain in the neck piece to pull out in that process, you know, it's probably going to be the driver's seat or passenger seat. Take that labor time, say it's 2.4 hours to R and R driver's seat, add some time to it to go looking for it. Like, I, I don't know why people like, why do they have to get like right down to that broken piece of wire for that first initial hour, you know, and that's the people that lose money on it. They, they spend two hours, you know, doing work that they only charge an hour for. And I, I, you know, you can't do it. It doesn't make sense. Um, especially like Matt said, uh, with undercar work, you know, I can put a front end, I can put ball joints, U joints and a straight axle F250 in hour and 45 minutes. The job pays six and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, why am I going to like, it, it makes no sense to on something that's literally harder to tackle to go the opposite way. Like, why would I work two hours for one hour pay on something that goes the opposite way? Like, it, it doesn't make any sense, but there's shops out there doing it, mm -hmm. you know, and why people can't wrap their head around taking their parts, their parts margin, average parts margin per hour, plus their labor out of a bay that's doing undercar, add that together and charge that for diag. I have no idea why nobody can wrap their head around doing that. Like... It, you know, it's all cute for the first hour to charge normal, but if you're going to put four hours into a car, yeah, you got to get, you got to get 350 an hour. You're going to make 350 an hour putting pads and rotors on on the next bay over. What the heck are you doing? Right. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. Does that have something to do with how the tech's getting paid? Uh, you know, whereas, okay, so yeah, you're talking about flat rate, right? You know, six hours for ball joints or, uh, you know, I'd get 1.5 Firestone for a diagnosis, regardless right. of what it is. Unless I, you know, put the hammer down and said, no, I'm not going any further until we get more time. But for most stuff, it was an hour and a half. But that was that was the flat rate thing. So, yeah, of course, I gravitated more to the suspension and the alignment and the sure. the gravy part stuff. Um, and I like the Diag, though. Um, and, and I was guilty of that. Right. I'd be like you know, almost to my time and I knew I was close and I just keep going. Cause I'm like, Oh, I, I want to find out what it is. And I wouldn't even stop to talk to the service writer. I just keep, you know, digging until I find the part, but yeah, you lose, I, you lose out on that. But I think there's, there's a difference, right? Like when you say, Hey, I'm close. Like, I don't know. I'll go back to the fuel pump example, right? Like, Hey, you realize that the fuel pump goes through the bulkhead connector and in your hour, let's say you're at 59 minutes. And you have one side pinned out. You're like, oh, it's going to take me another 15 minutes to pin out the other side. Yeah, I probably wouldn't ask for any more time. I'd probably just pin it out, finish my test, and just eat my 15, 20 minutes. Like, once in a while, I feel that's okay. Because for you to stop, go get more time, come yeah. back, 
I think how you're, it's sold you're gonna go. Is a big deal oh too. shit! What was I doing? Where was I at? What was I? You know, you, you'll end up losing twenty more minutes yeah. because you stopped. So sometimes there is a money loss to actually make the money, right? Because once you found, let's say it is that bulkhead connector that that has that volt drop. Now I'm stopping, calling the customer. Hey, ma'am, sir, whatever. They, them, he, sure, it, whatever. You know, got to be politically correct on the podcast. <clears throat> um, you have a huge volt drop going through your bulkhead connector. We figured it out. You know, we we need to take take some more stuff out of your car. We could test t- through it, and we know what's there. Um, it's going to be like two and a half hours for us to gain access to it and and possibly repair it. But we need to gain access to it to make sh- to see how bad the damage is. It's going to be two and a half three hours. If we can repair it to that, then we're just going to repair it, and we're not going to call you back. Is that okay? Right. right. So then you can bump the other side of the repair time up a little to make up that 20 minutes you wasted. Because the car's there to get fixed. If you need to bump up your repair time 20 minutes because you went 20 minutes over on your Diag, nobody's going to complain. But if you have to bump up their repair time like three or four hours, now they're going to complain. Yeah. Right? I think a lot of that, too, is huge at the counter. I mean, I guess for you it's different because you're mobile. Um, and, like, you don't have somebody at the counter. Like, for me, like, like we ain't, we ain't calling the customer in our shop to go from hour one to hour two. Like, you know, if it if it takes me two hours, that's what you're going to pay. Like, we're not going to even call the customer. Um, you know, we're out in the now, middle of farm country. It's a little different. I was um, going to say, do you give the customer, like, a heads up? Like, hey, this could be anywhere from one to three hours when they drop it off. Like, just as a warning. Usually I, I at the front counter, they, they ask, you know, hey, listen, we're going to have at least 200 into this. Um, is it okay if we go, you know... 500 or whatever and they they it's typically sometimes they ask sometimes they don't i mean a lot of our customers are long time customers for like 10 years you know what i mean so it's 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 just a little different than how a lot of people operate you know and that's and that's for regular you know that's for like regular cars you know like science projects that's a different story you know i'll just i we did a bmw that was 300 to get through the door We looked at it for an hour and a half, and I said, all right, this is how far we're going to have to go. We need 2,500 bucks or else, you know, drag it out. And the guy paid $2,500 and we fixed the car. It's, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, you know, and those are for when you're getting into science projects that were, you know, towed out of this shop and then towed out of this other Euro shop because they couldn't get the dme to program or whatever because it didn't have any communication because you know lord help we check that do you guys have different pricing scales depending on what you're doing Uh, right like so euro for instance or it's a network diag or it's a drivability diagnosis or it's electrical is or is it just diagnostic and you pay or the customer would pay per hour yeah ours is the same okay yeah ours is the same um the the difference ours is just not it's not really when the going gets tough it, the hours involved are less accounted for and the value of the job is more accounted for you know what i mean okay um so you know i you know we we put a uh pcm and a ford fusion the other day that the guy I, well a couple weeks ago that the guy had like who knows how much time and money into over this broken wire and he smoked his PCM. He had like half the interior of the car apart and it was like, you know, it was like a thousand dollars for two and a half hours and to install a used PCM that we paid 84 bucks for. And that's, you know, you've been, you've been working on it for four days, dude. You know what I mean? It's got a new Mm -hmm. starter, a new battery and you smoked your PCM while you tested it because you're jumping power around and uh, you know, uh, same thing. We got a power stroke sitting out back right now. The guy's been bolting parts on it for six months. It still doesn't run. And that was 500 to come through the door. I went back there, opened the hood. The passenger side battery was missing, and all the battery cables were all twisted together, like <laughs> twist ties. And I said, okay, double it, because you need two batteries and terminal work. It's $1,000 to get going on this truck. Guess what? He dropped off the cash yesterday, and we're going to get going on it for 1000 bucks. You know, I, that's just how it's got to be sometimes. You can't lose your ass on stuff. 
Mm-hmm. What about you guys, Matt and Matt? You guys have different pricing depending on what the job is? <clears throat> Not for the job. I mean, we have tiered pricing for essentially our standard door rates, if you will. Um, and then uh, European light duty diesels is a different rate. And then um, the, the diag rate is the highest. And but that covers any and all diagnosis? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, I mean, almost anything really you could just say technology related, if that makes sense. So diagnostics, programming, ADOS, everything. But not like a, a cupped wheel or, or a tire or something like that? Typically not. Not that okay. that hasn't happened. You know, if the NVH system's coming out. Sure. Yeah. Guess what? Um, but I, yeah, we, I would say we follow a lot of like what Brian's saying that first fee, like okay, first up, first thing up front, nobody talks time. We don't bring up yeah, the word hours or minutes or nothing. It's just like Brian was saying, he never said time, like his advisors, whoever are interacting with the clients, they don't talk time. They talk dollars and that's what uh, ours do. Cause once we give them a, like a time, now they can they can do a little bit of math. Sure, and we don't need them to do that. But that first fee, if you will, the initial inspection fee is that. Sometimes it's an assessment. We may figure it out in that time, and that's great. And even at that, like Brian said, sometimes you have to factor in the value of what you just did. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's subjective, right? It, you don't. Uh, and that's kind of maybe difficult to qualify, but you do have to take in consideration, like, what's your capability level? Did you figure this out because of s- tools that you invested in? Like, you have this, not that the U Activate is so expensive, but you have it. Nobody else does. Mm-hmm. You know, or I have the factory tool. The factory tool mm-hmm. lets me do, like, my Matt's story with the um, Honda data. The aftermarket tool may not provide that. His tool did. It's not that the HDS is so, or IHDS is so freaking expensive. Toyota. Yeah, but he Toyota. has it. Was it a Toyota? It was a tech stream? Sorry. Whoops. I heard, I'm still ha- salivating over the Honda updating. It's the seven minutes. Seven. <laughs> I know, I haven't stopped thinking about it either. Yeah. Tech stream really had the data myself. in it, and the aftermarket tool may not have. He has the tech stream. Does anyone else have tech stream nearby? Like there's value in that. There's value in finding it because of skill, experience, and investment in equipment and or training. So that that has to factor. And you shouldn't be losing money at doing this. You should be profiting and arguably profiting more to keep expanding that capability, which is maybe... in some cases, not just expanding, it's um, maintaining. It's expensive. Yeah. yeah. You know, somebody's going to come out with a new scan tool. And I don't mean Snap-on. I mean, uh, eventually, I mean, Chrysler's about due. You know, they just came out with the MDP. <laughs> there should be, Shut up. I just got my other MDP. I'm going to punch you through this laptop. <laughs> There's another pod coming out. Right? But I mean, oh, that's, that how it, doesn't work. that's how it goes. Yeah. And... You get away with the VCM two for Ford for a while, and now you got a vehicle sitting in there, and knowing like you need the VCM three, and not that it's so gosh darn expensive, but you had a VCM and then a VCM two, and then now a yeah, VCM3. and now the VCM threes are on such intergalactic national back order that too. So yeah, it, the initial fee is usually a lot of times an assessment, and then like Brian said. You, you kind of get into it, whether, you know, 15 minutes in or 45 minutes in or a legit hour in. It's like, oh, this is going to be a project. Like, all right, now we got to brace them. Are you willing to are you willing to invest five hundred dollars in this? Are you willing to invest a thousand dollars in this? And that's kind of the game. And I think Matt's uh, suggestions are really strong in that. You start talking about tests. You know, what am I getting for my $1,000? Or you're going to get a fixed car. 
that's that's intangible, right? That's that's hard to assign value to. Right. If we all went to the doctor and you know, they look in your eyes and your mouth and your ears and then says, you know, you're willing to give me a thousand bucks to make you be- feel better? Uh, if you guarantee I feel better, but what are you going to do for a thousand bucks? You know, what are, is he just going to, you know, go Google it and then handle you, hand you, hand you the meds? What? I don't know. So right. I think rattling off a few things that you're going to do and maybe having us uh, where applicable a stack of results, whether it's printed out or attached to the invoice, something, you know, s- screenshots of the scan tools, screenshots of a uh, scope, photos, yeah, you know, look at it, your interior gutted to find this broken wire back by the C pillar, you know, where the rear seat goes in, you know, just it, it's giving, showing them that there is value in what you're doing. And then sometimes that value is, I knew where to look. I knew what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I've run into this before. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, everything always just seems like it's either 20 minutes or four hours, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that <laughs> seems to be like the actual, yeah. I don't, most of mine, the only way they're 20 minutes is if I spent <laughs> four hours on it at one point in my career, you know. Um, and then, yeah, the next one's easy. Um, I uh, The first 6.0 diesel... Uh, no start, no start, or was that a no start? No, it died while driving. The first 6.0 diesel died while driving I ever worked on. I worked on it from, like, when the shop closed around 6 p.m. till midnight for about two weeks. And, uh, yeah, now it's, like, everyone's, like, 15 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, I had to put, like, 50 hours into the first one <laughs> after work, you know. Right. And, uh, uh you know, and that's why you should be charging appropriately for your time because not if everyone is willing or able to do that to put in, you know, get their ass kicked like that or seek out that education, however you want to do it. But yeah, getting now, your ass kicked sure does it that, well. Yeah. Now I have people that took them apart, bring them to me with the engine parts in a box in the bed of the truck, and <laughs> I can just put the thing back together for you, you know, after tearing into one for 50 hours straight. I can ID the O rings like flashcards. I can tell you where it goes. Wow. You know, but there what? was a lot of sweat equity that went into that. You know what I mean? Like, I mm-hmm. was freaking, it was freaking rough, man. I mean, there was, I remember that job. There was like two nights. We have a little room upstairs at the shop. You know, it was before I was married. Two of the nights I slept overnight in the shop. I didn't even go home. Mm-hmm. I was like, I got to make this truck run. I said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I, I think gotta make the- this thing run. The nature of why we started doing this is feeds well into that. Because if you're a small shop, like you're a one man, two man thing, it's a lot easier to remember such sweat sweat equity. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like if you're the one that did all the work, it's easy to remember. Because I guess egocentric bias essentially is what it is. You remember sure. that, so it's easy to go like that last one, or it took me all this time to figure out what this was or where this went or to test this or how to test that or what a good one looks like. But if you get into a situation where it's now larger, where you have a service advisor, service manager, owner, who isn't necessarily back there with you, and they may remember vaguely that you got your butt kicked on this blah, blah, blah. But when it comes back around... They don't necess- they're not necessarily capable and I don't mean that as like a insult and by any means it's you know sound like the dad from American Pie it's very natural that <laughs> they just they wouldn't associate it the same way so in sure. some way there's got to be a way for the back of house specifically the technician to communicate to the front of house about what it took to get um, to that, you know, to arrive at that diagnosis or that uh, finding based on experience from before of sure sweat equity. Well, yeah, and, a, like, a we lot of times you'll have a service writer that didn't even work with you when you got your butt kicked on it. Yeah, They've only that. seen you do, you know, figure it out in 10 minutes. And they're like, yep. yeah, those are easy for Sean. He'll just, uh, he'll just check it out in 10 minutes. And they don't even... Yeah. 
Yeah. They don't even know that y- you spent four hours yeah. or stayed up all I, night or whatever. I literally deal with that sometimes. I got, we got one service writer that I got to like straighten out sometimes. Cause he's like, what do you, what do you mean? You know, what do you mean? $150 to configure that and this, that, and the other thing. It's like, listen, bud, <laughs> three scan tools out. And the first one I ever did took me four hours to figure out how to do with this aftermarket equipment. So you just chill the F out and you just charge $150. I told you, you know, <laughs> and I had to call some angry little leprechaun guy very <laughs> angry. To push the fucking button. <laughs> he told me that if i try to do that ever again he's gonna fly up here buy a step ladder climb it and punch me in the face <laughs> yeah that, that's on my tier of diagnostics if i have scundridge call the price is going up for what i'm charging the customer <laughs> And, and not yeah, and just because of the sheer embarrassment of having to call it. <laughs> or you cloned over the, the you cloned over the module on your kitchen table at three in the morning. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. they don't know. You gotta make sure they know, but they should also be aware enough to value that or I, uh, maybe not aware, but my scunder calls are never good because no, I don't know no. I don't know if Matt's ever fixed one. Like he's like, Yep, it's broke. Like if I call Matt, <laughs> that <laughs> sucker is broke. <laughs> Like I don't, I don't. Have I ever gotten a quick answer out of you, Matt? No, I don't no. Think once. I, I usually am like, I'll call you back tomorrow, and then yeah. like a week later, I'm like, Hey, I think I figured out your problem, and he's like, Oh, good, it's still sitting here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to jump back to something Fanzo said. The assess. Um, Sean and I have a big advantage over Brian and Matt. We can assess the car a lot faster than you guys can, because one, it's usually it's. Uh, well, for me, it's always a shop. If a personal customer calls me, I give them like 20 shops they can take it to because I'm like, I'm not dealing with your BS first. Like it has to be at a shop. I'm only working at a shop anymore. <clears throat> so if a customer calls me and says, hey, we've got like 50 hours in this, I'm like, okay, I need to see all the codes it had when it came in. I want your pre-scan. I need to see what you have now. I want to see your estimate of what you've done. I need to know where you ordered parts from and what all you've attempted to do. <clears throat> and I have them email it to me. See, we get all that after the fact. After we figure yeah, it out yeah. and it's fixed, then we get Oh, all that. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, secret squirrels. Yeah. So I try to get as much as I can before I kind of give them, because I'm dealing with shop owners. They just want dollars. How much dollars is this going to cost me? Yeah, they don't and care about hours. So, yeah, yeah, they don't care about the hours. They just want dollars. And uh, cheap shop owners, that's my answer. And uh, <laughs> so... I need to know some information before I even take on the job. And so I might have an hour, hour and a half looking up some of these codes that I'm like, I, I did not know you could set a code for like implausible wheel speed sensor um, validation. I'm like, what does that mean? And, right. and it was on a Nissan the other day and it was because somebody dropped the rear cradle out and they swapped the left and right side plug. And so when you make a corner, instead of the left two and the right two matching, nope, now the left front and the right rear match. And so it's a validation code because it's going, this is impossible. The wheel speed sensor works, and we know it works, but this Mm -hmm. isn't a possible setting. Like, the trouble tree makes no sense. And I had an hour and a half into the car, and I'm driving, and I'm like, every time I make a left or right turn, you know, the EBS light comes on. This is really weird. And then... I walk over and I was talking to the tech. He goes, well, you know, we took the subframe out of that, didn't you? And I was like, did the wiring harness, is that on the subframe or was that left in the car? He's like, no, it stayed in the car. And I'm like, oh, any chance you put the left on the right and the right on the left for the wheel speed sensor wiring? And he's like, mm. like, let's get a wiring diagram and check colors. Oh, look, it's backwards. But I mean, I can assess the car and I, I probably give that money away, right? Like I'll do that at. 10 o'clock at night like we're doing the podcast now right like my kids are in bed my wife's probably not asleep because i talk louder than a freaking lumberjack with a chainsaw but hey who cares but i'll sit at tv and watch like all the star wars movies but i'm researching cars and i'm getting ready for the next day and it was something that i realized like wow i should really cut my first hour of work time to 45 minutes because i've probably already put a half an hour or 45 minutes into the car at home Sure. On some of them. And so I'm assessing it and giving a price where you guys need to really charge just for the assess to give a price on the test. 
right? right? Like, I liked Fanzo's method of a doctor. If I go in with a doctor and say, hey, man, I got a 104-degree fever in my, and I got a sore throat, what's the first thing he's going to do? Oh, yeah, come in, let's look at you. He takes your blood pressure, checks your temperature, looks at your throat, checks all this other BS. It doesn't need to be checked, but they have to check it. And then he goes, well, you know what? That was the level one triage. The level two is going to be, we're going to shove this cotton swab down your throat, make you about gag to death, and then we're going to send it over and charge you for a lab test to make sure you have strep throat, right? And that's his level two. Um, so I think you are you can do a level one, level two if you want it at your shop. Um, I do it. I don't charge for it properly. But I usually make my, hey, yeah, I can come look at it. It's going to be three or four days. And I want three or four hundred bucks. Like I'm charging so much now for Diag that I probably have made it up because I'm sick of losing money. But if you're a single man shop owner, like I don't think there's anything wrong with getting the car in for your first hour, checking TSBs, checking the basic health of the car, and then going, all right, look, we looked at your car. We're kind of leaning this direction. To continue on with your Diag, we're going to test the following items. We're going to give you our test yeah. results. We need to narrow some things off the list. It's going to cost X amount of dollars. Um, do you want to continue with the test or not? And if they say no, just punt the car and move on to the next one. Like, yeah, I think I think a lot of guys get emotionally attached. To yeah, I do. Car. And I do. man, yep. I just we've all I had am, them cars that we've I thrown twenty thousand dollars at just to fix it. Yeah, I I will literally like today like we had like two people that didn't want to spend the money and we we just went to we just went to colossal taco me and my boss did i'm like oh I don't have colossal to taco kind of- are the tacos <laughs> oh, yeah. the size of you is yeah, that why you're so big yes it's fantastic but yeah <sighs> i was just like oh i don't have to go through them two cars well, i got a spare hour here he goes let's get out of here and go to the taco joint i was like all right let's go but uh i think a lot of people get emotionally attached to it they're like oh freaked out if the customer thinks they're too expensive like what's like what's the difference like if you're losing money on the job why what and you know well i want to know i want to know what's wrong with that car it's not all of them but there are definitely some ask me about a 99 volvo but but that's (laughs) That's gonna be a good story though yeah (laughs) if if you want to throw twenty thousand dollars of your own money at a car that's fine right like i could care less what you do with your money but when it comes to not paying your tax and not treating your tax right because you need to fix that car, that's not fair. And if you're the shop owner and you're losing that much money that you can't afford to pay your tax or buy the tools they need or take them to training, that's not fair either. Like, you can only have a heart as big as your bank account. And none of us have a bank account <laughs> big enough for our hearts. That's just the bottom line. Yeah, that's a good point. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I don't get emotionally attached until the car's actually in the shop. And then it's kind of like my ego gets in it. Yeah, if I'm already into the diagnosis of the vehicle, that's when that's when I get hooked. Yeah. Not always, but some of the time, definitely. Right. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. I said I'm not emotionally attached, but I'm about to brick a Mercedes valve body this week. So <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm Such emotionally attached as hell. <laughs> I can't send this car to the dealer. It just doesn't. It's like, you know, I, taking a shower with your socks on. It ain't going to hurt you, but it just doesn't feel right. You know? <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I have doubled my sales in the last two years. And the number one reason I doubled them was I said no more than I ever have in my life. Hey, can you come look at this 1999 Ford Ranger? No, no, I'm not. Well, why not? Well, it's a 1999 Ford Ranger. It doesn't run right. The plethora of problems I'm going to find is going to so far exceed the value of that Ranger that you should just go into the junkyard. That just no. That thing's a freaking cream puff. I'll guarantee it. The dash (laughs) might be a little bit weathered from some sunlight. (laughs) That's about it. Minor weathering. We have no emission testing, and so these people buy these cars drive them the check engine light could blink for six years and they're like "Eh, it runs okay (laughs) and then they take it to a shop because now it doesn't run right so you're like oh let's figure out why it doesn't run oh well let's see the purge valve is stuck so far open that you don't even need the fuel pump you're pulling in so many fumes from the (laughs) tank Next, we got a catalytic converter. That's Did they get like really applied. good fuel mileage, by the way? Because I'm pretty sure there was like an invention that they said in Popular Mechanics would get like 100 miles per gallon. I had a guy with a 
with a 07 F-150 in the other day that had the pink bottle of methanol with a vacuum line. <laughs> and he goes, I'm only getting 13 and a half miles a gallon with this thing. I go, well, I go, that must work because mine only got like seven back when I had it. <laughs> like, whatever, bud. 13 yeah. and a half. Hey, Matt, frame oh. was broke on that truck, but he had the pink bottle of methanol under the hood. Getting his <laughs> so he had that going for him. I put that... Put that up on the lift. I go, oh, better put that back down. That ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to oh, die. Man. Oh, this is outstanding. I mean, that was the it, parts is my big problem. Was and, and that's why I say no, right? Like COVID taught me to say no um, because it killed the parts. Like, okay, so I look at your 99 Ford Ranger and say, hey, look, yeah, coil seven's bad or coil six got a bad driver keep okay, going down well, buddy it's a ranger yeah um well, we do have some 50 v8 rangers around here with what? a 351 in them there was a shop that did nothing but va swaps and a ranger i hate that shop that's still so only glad. Has coil, though. yeah so <clears throat> i'm like you need a pcm oh we can't get it oh well i guess i could take the pcm home order parts fix it on my bench but right now i'm like stuck in a repair I'm now liable for the parts. Anything that goes wrong with that car, I own it for the rest of my life. So I'm just like, eh, need a PCM. Oh, well, I can't get one. Well, you owe me money for Diag. Well, now they're pissed off they owe you money for Diag on a, on a car they can't get parts for. And now they don't want to pay the Diag because they can't get a truck fixed anyway. So now they're going to tow it in like you told them to trade it in. Or they're going to trade it in like you told them to to begin with. So now I'm just like, oh, your car's over 15 years old? Pff, go trade it in and buy something new. For you guys in shops, is there stuff that you say no to? I mean, I don't know how your shop is structured, Brian, but like Matt, I know you guys are the go-to down there. So I would imagine it's tough to turn things away. I mean, where else are they going to go? Why do you think Matt's ego is so big? He doesn't say no. <laughs> yeah, this is big and not a good way. Um, yeah, we oh, – man. Maybe if it gets in to be – like safety issues where the frame is so bad and then we won't even let the customer come pick it up. Well, tell us where to have it towed. Mm. Um, I have, I've read about lawsuits involving that, I'm not trying to make this in about how to CYA or anything, but you know, even if I let them drive it out of the lot it might be enough that they could come back and say like, well, you thought it was good enough for them to drive away with. So we just, yeah, right. Tow it. You know, where do you want to tow it to? Your house? We'll have it dropped later. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, but like car lines, uh, you know, maybe some custom jobbers, maybe some high performance stuff. I just, every time a high performance type vehicle comes in, I struggle because I just don't live in that world. Mm -hmm. And everything's. I don't even know what the word would be. There's the, the wiring diagrams are really Nothing non-existent. Yeah. What's that? Nothing is standardized. There. Yeah, that's probably a better word. Nothing yeah. standardized. For lack of a better term. Yeah. You don't even know if the scan tool's telling you the correct information. Yeah. It ain't. I, I promise, it's not. Yeah. So I've always <laughs> yeah. struggled with that. You know, a high performance car comes in or something. They've souped up at home and it's got a different programmer you know yeah teed into the pcm or something like that and it runs like crap and it's like i can you put it back to normal and then let me look at it mm -hmm. well if i do that it runs fine <laughs> two hundred dollars please i just Blame so, the tuner. everybody else does Have it yeah i just don't know i maybe that's the stuff we'll, we turn away is that it's been messed with with high performance stuff, especially like um, non like big name or something like, you know, if it comes in with like some really, I don't know if high end is even the right word, but well known. Yeah. If it's Holly a Mustang with a Kenny system. Bell super. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You feel pretty good about. Yeah. Being Cummins with a bank system. Or, yeah, yeah. 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 Banks engineering. A little more comfortable with that. Yeah. Edge. You know, whatever. Yep, exactly. But a fast fast fuel system on a Duramax. I'm comfortable with working on those. Yep. Um, but there's, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean, Matt. You get it. You get into some performance stuff, and it's just, 
uh, you, it's never worth it. Performance is never worth it. You can never make your money back. As soon as I find back. out, as soon as I find out the car is tuned, all my shit gets backed up. I get in my <laughs> van and I drive my happy ass away. There is yep. no bill. Rate to, there rate is to DQ. Nothing. Rate to Dude, Dairy Queen. You, oh yeah, you can't. You can't pay me enough to work on a tuned vehicle anymore. Uh, I, there was a wood chipper I had to turn away once. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, it had a Perkins what? diesel on it. So okay. the guy calls up and he's the like, "Hey, it doesn't Cummins. run. We fixed this. Yep, it doesn't start. Will you look at this?" I'm like, "Well, you know, I'm thinking wood chipper, like a little thing. No, this is a trailer. But, you know, the ones that can put like a six inch <clears throat> uh, diameter. You throw your uh, C Tech in who just ruined another car. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah." Like the one they should have used in Fargo. Yeah. And yeah, so he hauls it in and I'm like, well, okay, Perkins diesels. I'm kind of familiar with those. No, 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 no. Now I learned that this Perkins diesel, because it was used in this brand of wood chipper, is proprietary. So any kind of... Oh, yeah. There I sat. Like, I am SOL. You're stranded. And I checked the oil because I didn't want to get burned by that. <laughs> um, and then, so most of those have uh, level sensors and stuff. Yeah. Oil level was good, and I jumped the switch just for grins to see what would happen. And I'm like, I, I got to say I'm out. I have no way of talking to this thing. And so he ends up driving it like three hours away to get to the whatever dealer service center. That's about it. That type of stuff ends up getting turned away. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, we've done wood chippers. We've done tractors. We've done. Yeah, like, but you're like out in the tractors. place where like the wind blows too hard and you lose power for four days. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Where? You. <laughs> Me? You're like, oh look, the wind blew real hard, knocked some ice off a tree. I ain't gonna have power for four days till they come out here and. Rerun a new power line twelve miles through yeah, the woods. Yeah, that's how we. Yeah, that literally. I gotta wait for story. the linemen to get out of high school today because that's uh that's their new <laughs> this week. Yeah, yeah, that literally <laughs> happened here. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, if you would have had a Ford F one fifty, they can get it to the shop. I can. Yeah, if they can get it to the shop, we'll go ahead and work on it. <clears throat> so uh, you know that's been you know seventy six Ford CL nine thousand semi trucks. That's been snow blowers uh wood chippers uh pto shaft work you know also also whatever if it if i can get it to the building it doesn't even have to get in the building if i just get it to the building chances are uh we're gonna take a pretty good shot at trying to get it fixed up you know we had some of that when i was at an independent shop too uh, but that usually tended to be when we didn't have other I would say more profitable work to do, right? right. If there's a, a ton of ball joints and wheel bearings and water pumps to do, no, take your tractor somewhere else. We're not doing that. But if we're slow and there's nothing else, sure, let's get it in. Let's see what happens. Um, so there would be I don't know, a little bit of discretion depending on the volume of the shop yeah. at the time. I mean, there's – we pretty much – you know, it just doesn't matter. We pretty much just take it and uh, – <laughs> At the end, it, it's it's worked out because you end up working on so much stuff that you don't have real good service information for. You get a pretty good idea for how to look at something. You get a pretty good idea for how a lot of things actually work in the medium duty and heavy duty world. To where you know it just it's really not a big deal when the stuff comes in. You know, and, and everything everything works the same right like a you know if you work on 60 diesels you know half the caterpillars that come in medium duties are hui so yep. it, well, you know it runs you know you get to know what fuel system you got by looking at scan tool data without even popping the hood and then you can start making decisions on what directions to go when stuff ain't working right you know so do you I, have a medium duty scan tool then he's got a snap on yeah yeah. See, and There's, that's the problem. Like, I, just, I go to, sh I go to shops, and they're like, "Hey, man, can you work on this like F seven fifty? And I'm like, "Uh, what? what yeah. Why?" And they're like, "Oh, well, we brought it in because it's a no start, and we can't really talk to it because it's got this like round plug and." Da -da -da. And I'm like, "Yeah. 
Oh, you have a medium duty truck and you don't have the medium duty tool? Yeah, that's not my problem, sir. Have a good day, click. <laughs> I don't have a medium duty tool. Like, why would I take that job on? Like, don't take something that you know, like, you could get buried in easy. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, medium duty tends to be pretty easy because most of it runs on the same. Actually, right now with Ford, Chevy, and Dodge, I think all their medium duty stuff comes with an engine that's either the same exact as the pickup trucks or very similar at this point. Um, uh, the new yeah, but that Silverado. wasn't the case forever. What's that? That wasn't always the case. Yeah, right. Yeah, you could get a Ford. You know, you used to be able to get a Ford F six fifty with a Cat, a Cummins, or a or an International. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was back when you could buy a real Ford. What's that? Back when you could buy a real Ford. Stop. You had a you had a Cummins engine, a, you know, and the rest of it was a Ford. So you beat all the Dodge electrical <laughs> problems out, and you had a good truck. I had a Nissan those, the other day with a Cummins IFPs engine in it. Yeah. yeah, they did that. It was a Nissan yep. Titan. I can tell yeah. you it was from 2015, no, 2014 to 2019, and I got one that needs the Bosch Cummins controller. Let me tell you, they are proud of that sucker. Yeah. Do you need Four something special? Years. Is there something special to program them? Is there a different tool or software? No, it's or? Alt-3. Okay. I'll talk to you later on that one. So I uh, I told mine to take it to the dealer because you ain't going to want to pay me what I want for it because... If that controller is twenty seven hundred dollars, I'm billing you huge. Oh, that so ain't bad. Goes... I thought it was going to be real money. You said <laughs> Cummins it's a diesel. Nissan. You said Cummins <clears throat> diesel engine control module. I'm thinking, yeah, he found out that they're like forty nine hundred bucks. No, 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 no. It's not a Cummins controller. It's a Bosch controller. It's a yeah. It's that's an not... EDC seventeen uh, yeah. CP fifty. Yeah, that that engine was developed for use in that application that doesn't get used anywhere else on the face of the planet. Yeah, so it's, and it's kind of like Cummins Junior. Yeah, it's but they <laughs> it's want like the one. Allison that's in the Chevy pickups, right? It's like Allison's ugly stepsister Stephanie. It's not really <laughs> like an Allison. Uh, you know you want to talk about expensive modules? If you got a stack of those TCMs, you got some uh, you got some bank right now. Thirty five hundred for an un. Confirmed, a non-confirmed good one was the last one I just looked at. Non-confirmed. Yep. Might work, might not. Get your wallet You know what's out. funny? My one transmission shop I service all the time, he, uh, he has a fleet of trucks that have the Allison's, and he knows the TCM's go bad, so he keeps like 10, 12 of them in stock at all times. He could probably just and buy the, a brand new truck with the amount of TCM's he's got in stock. Yeah, and so the other, the last time he ordered them was like, eight nine months ago and the guy's like man these are getting hard to find he goes oh send me 20 of them then because i don't you know this fleet can't be without i told him the other day i'm like dude you should like quadruple your price because nobody has these things but you right and if you you can't so i took one apart to try to fix it that's that's something that doesn't happen it's got yeah like, once, it, once it goes the pins go through the case it like they turn into like these a lot of them turn into like these things that look like it looks like thread going down to the board. I'm like, that's, I go, I can't fix a normal module. There ain't no way I can <laughs> fix this thing. I was I've had a I couple mean. of the like t best of the best guys that doing that tell me that nope, it ain't getting fixed. So uh, it was like I'm not even gonna attempt or bother yeah. or look at it. Yeah, that's what I did. I I called somebody that has a guy that used to uh, repair. Uh, missile systems for the U.S. Marines doing his board work, and when he said oh, he can fix it, I'm like, oh, that's, <laughs> <unfixable."> <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. If you hear that from that guy, not fixable. That's all I had to hear. There is no way I was doing it. Yeah, Lockheed so, Martin's in the wrong business. They should just be manufacturing TCMs. Yeah, hey, let's <laughs> <laughs> missiles. I thought, what else we don't work on? Uh, oh, or we'll be turn good. away motorhomes. Okay, We're oh, just not God. set up well. Man, yeah, I got a leg up, well. up on Matt. Yeah. Oh yeah, you Let's can have that. Every motorhome and in the county is in our shop. It seems like <laughs> I will refer them to you. Oh. I know this I guy. Worked, I worked on a motorhome and it had a slide out engine, and you could run it when it was slid out. Oh yeah, yeah they have. I'm both, like, yeah. that's crazy. Look at, 
this is nice. You can work <laughs> on the whole thing here. Yeah, that's the only one they ever built like that, so don't get excited about the accessibility. <laughs> that's, oh, well, that's the only yeah. one I've worked on. So Yeah. Because I was like, yeah. I'm not working on it. I'm not trying to cram myself in there. Guys like, no, man, the engine pulls right out. It's no big deal. You can scope it all you want. I'm like, okay. He was right. So how about intermittent stuff? Um, I, I'm just thinking of something that I kind of turn away. And for me, it's just time. Like, okay, maybe I can build properly for it, but I got a lot else to do in my day. I can't take four hours to get your car to act up and then not have an a- maybe not have an answer, right? I can bill you for the tests and document. Um, so for me, it doesn't make sense. But how do you guys handle that in relationship to diagnostic and charging appropriately and delivering, you know, something to the customer? I will... I'll take intermittent stuff in and 50% of my intermittence, I can reverse engineer through whatever codes or history codes it's set in freeze frame and get a pretty good idea where to look. So I already am hooked up and testing for when the fault actually occurs. Um, if I get an intermittent in, if I go drive it for a half hour, and it doesn't do anything, and I bring it in, and there's no codes relevant to anything they're talking about. I come get it. Yeah, I I, yeah. I can't. Sorry. Yeah. You know? My my rule of thumb is is will it do it within 20 minutes? If the answer is no, call me when it does it within 20 minutes every time. I, yeah, unfortunately, I I don't know what to tell them. I can't yeah. I can't drive the car for four hours. Depending I on the will. nature of the. Sorry. I will look up TSBs because there's a lot of TSBs sure. for intermittent. So, yep. so that is one thing I do do. Like as soon as a customer calls, I'm like, just send me the VIN and the symptoms and let me see if there's a yep. TSB in the OEM service information because I have all the OEM service information yep. now. And and if there's a TSB that kind of addresses their symptoms or I can say, hey, does this sound more like the problem? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's exactly it. I'm like, oh, there's a flash to take care of that. You yep. know what I mean? Then, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll come down and I'll try, we'll try it. I'll definitely search for TSBs and uh, I'll I'll type it into Identifix all day. You know, I can't find a fix. It's I can't find a fix. <laughs> yeah, I can't find because none of the techs using it can find a fix. Yeah, yeah, that I can't find why the intermittent thing isn't happening. So I'll <laughs> type it in there and whatever it says is normally broke. I'll go hit with a hammer a couple times and do whatever. But you know, you know what I mean. I'm not gonna sure. I'm not if you hit blow. it with a hammer, it is broken. Yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> Neither did it anyways. <laughs> bad. D- depending yeah. on the nature of the issue, I'll, I do just like Brian says, uh, and then I might run it through the car wash and just see what happens. Right. You have a car wash? Not at the shop, but we have one that we're good good buddies with. and There's been a few of them that had to get towed out. <laughs> I had stuck You're in the car wash up, again. <laughs> Thought it was so, a good idea. So I worked at a shop, and whenever we had intermittence, the boss would give us five bucks and tell us to go get ice cream at the Seven Eleven. It was half mile away, without fail. Every time the car would no longer start at Seven <laughs> Eleven, and you could get the car towed back, and it would start, and you'd drive there, go get another ice cream, and it'd break down. But the next time you did it, you'd have all your tools in the trunk, and you're like going ham out the Seven yeah, Eleven parking right. lot. But yeah, it always worked. Run them, run them through the car washer. We just take the the water hose and spray the crap out of the thing, and you know. But yeah, see, but I, I think, don't have corrosion and rust like you guys do, so I don't, I don't see. Yeah, any I don't know how you guys make you any do. money down there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how do you ever beat book time? What's book yeah, time? Right? <laughs> uh, programming's one that I don't think shops charge for. I know it's not on Diag, but they definitely don't charge for it. Um, for me, I have the advantage. I'm sure Sean does. We buy everything yearly because we know it'll pay for it. And and I see shops going, "Oh, I'll program that Chrysler for 180 dollars." I'm like, "Yeah, right. what?" <laughs> you got 150 into it. What what are you doing? We're and, we're yearly and it's 250. Yeah, that's Okay. Um for a Chrysler. But I 
I see shops just going, well, you know, it only cost me $30 for the script. I'm like, yeah, okay, so you paid $30 to Honda. You spent four hours waiting for the damn thing to update because you're not <laughs> – you're doing it when only one quarter of the server's on. And <laughs> and now what? Like, come on. Like, you should be 2 two fifty on it because – you really wasted a lot of time in getting it set up to program, especially if the shop doesn't program all the time, right? Like they have a J box, they're they're very capable, and they do the ones that they need to do. But then every time they do it, they waste three hours updating their computer. Yeah, that ain't, that doesn't work. It, it doesn't work. I yeah. actually have a shop that they used to be like that, and then they got a Chrysler and they couldn't do it because it was like when Y Tech first came out and and then you're like, oh, we don't we don't know how to use this. Come do it. I showed up, programmed it, and laughed and charged him like 150 bucks. And the guy's like, you're in and out in like 25 minutes. I'm like, yeah, what's your point? It's all I do all day. And he's like, do you do all cars? I'm like, well, most of them. And I'm like, domestics and Asian, sure. And he's like, oh, I'm calling you for everyone. Hey, you want to buy a J-Box? And, and I think <laughs> I ended up buying his tool off him because it was a Master Tech VCI and I wanted a spare. But he... To this day, he doesn't program. He's like, just call Matt, just call Matt, because he's like, yeah. I can do two brake jobs, and he, <laughs> you know, yeah. He's like, it's just not worth it. Call Matt. We're uh, anything that we have yearly, we're one eighty on, except for Chrysler, which is two fifty. Um, my rates are going up now. Most of the stuff, most of the stuff, I use once a week. I mean. You know, I we I don't obviously I don't do as much programming as you do, but it's minimum two cars a day. Yep. Minimum two cars a day for programming. Um especially we we got we have a lot of dodges and jeeps up here, so there's a lot of freaking programming, you know. Um Yeah, it's you know, and uh anything we don't have a yearly for, I'll uh you know, it depends on the subscription cost, and sometimes they're up into two fifty, like the Chryslers are. You know, you'd have. I mean, I I don't know how somebody could do one at two fifty if they didn't have a yearly for Chrysler. Uh, the cost. What's it cost? Like a hundred and hundred twenty five ish dollars. Yeah. yeah. Right. If you're like gonna do it like per time, it's like one twenty five or one twenty seven or I don't know in that range. And more if you need a pin code. Yeah, yeah another fifty bucks uh. if you need a pin. Yeah, we have an autel for that. But anyways, um not for a nineteen Wrangler you don't. <laughs> hey, uh it works. for for a twenty twenty one uh compass I was able to. Oh no kidding. Nice. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, if you get the bypass cable it'll work. Oh yeah, baby. You ever see three hundred and fifty pounds of beef up under the dash of a compass? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know the compass would hold three hundred and fifty pounds of beef. Yeah, that makes both of us. <laughs> but uh yeah, you know, like some of the stuff we get into, if it's you know, if it's going to cost a lot of money, you got to charge more. You know, that's that's all there is to it. But yeah, I bet you a lot of shops. I don't know around us. I don't, I I feel like our market's like a depressed area. Like I don't know. I just took a young guy to a multimeter usage class the last two nights, and the amount of guys in forties and fifties that couldn't get their multimeter turned on at the beginning of the class was a little bit alarming. So it uh. I don't think too many shops are doing programming. And in fact, when some of the stuff came up in that class, like most of the guys were talking about just kicking it to the dealer. That's that's what they do. They just kick it to the you, dealer. You say that, but when when I was making a list for when I hired my brother to come work for me, do you know what the first item I put on my list was? The first what? item I put on my list. IDSF GRS? Nope. Fuses. Oh, duh. And, yeah. I, I can't that. tell you how much money I make off of just putting a 10 amp fuse in the right spot. Yeah, oh, right. There we go. Oh, yeah. There we go. Like, I knew that. How about out of gas? I had I had two back to back this week. It was two different shops. One was a Kia, one was a Hyundai. Wait, they called you to Diag and out of gas car. Well, so the first one was a hybrid. So the, they had driven it until the point where the, bat, the high voltage battery was discharged so the engine wouldn't crank. So. I'll give them that one a little bit because they don't want to touch high voltage stuff. Okay, whatever. But the next one, they pulled it in, did a column, and then it wouldn't start. Ah. And it was out of gas. And I just done the other one. So 
I seen that little e the like little e light blinks on those Kia Hyundai's when it's out of gas, and then you can look at the scan tool for the fuel pressure. But I was just like, "You guys got any gas around here?" <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I take I take those easy ones because I get my butt kicked another time. You know, uh, it's ebbs and flows to this for sure. Yeah, yeah but I, <clears throat> I just don't understand like. Shops want to get into these really advanced diagnostic classes. And <clears throat> I've been listening to a book. I'm going to throw throw some books out there. Um, I've been listening to leadership books. Uh, one of them was Extreme Ownership. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I more listen to it for the war stories just because they're fun. Um, but it really talks about how to like own yourself and own what you're doing. And then he has another one called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And chapter is three, Jocko? Yeah, Jocko. And I, I can't, Whitliff or Jocko Waylif? will link. Yeah, but Jocko there's will a, link. Yeah, but then there's the other guy that writes them with them. Oh, um, I don't know. Yeah, there's two of them. If you, if you buy the audible books like I do, <clears throat> um, they read their own books. And so each one writes a chapter and you can tell who wrote the chapter because the voices change. Um, but anyway, he talks about the uh, one chapter I just read was um, good leaders train and they train hard. And I was laughing because I'm like, man, that is so not our automotive industry. Like our leaders are just like, oh, he fixed the car. He doesn't need to go to training. And then he said that the hard training needs to always go back to the fundamentals because he goes, when we were in combat situations, like advanced combat skills didn't save lives. You know what did? Knowing the fundamentals saved lives. And he gives like numerous ev- examples of all the SEALs who really wanted to know, like, oh, we're going to do this advanced weapon tactics and blah, blah, blah. He was were guys that, like, I didn't care to have on my team. But the guy who's like, hey, man, can we learn how to breach and clear this room again? Oh, okay, let's breach and clear this room again. Oh, just one more time. He goes, that guy who you know could say, hey, let's breach and clear that room. You don't have to hesitate because you know he's practiced the fundamentals 100,000 times. Where the guy who did the advanced tactics, if you send him in to breach and clear the room, he might not know really how to breach and clear a room, but he says he does. Yeah. And he's like, so always, always, always practice the fundamentals more than you do the advanced because the fundamentals will will bail you out of more jams than the advanced stuff will. And I think in the automotive industry, we totally forget that. Nobody goes back to the basics. Oh, hey, I checked the fuses. Did you check they were installed in the correct location? Like... Well, there's this weird idea or assumption that if you understand the most advanced concepts, you will automatically then understand the fundamentals rather than vice versa. Where it's like, <clears throat> Who in the fuck came up with that stupid idea? I just, it seems to be a trend. It seems yeah. like, uh, let me skip over these fundamental things and I will go to the most advanced class. And if I can kind of get, if I can kind of understand that, then I'll, I'll understand the fundamentals and it never really occurs that if I would hit the fundamental class, I would have a much easier time grasping the advanced concepts. Guys are sitting there taking classes that are talking about can network arbitration and they don't, they literally can't get their meter out and voltage drop a circuit. And they walk out of the classroom going like that instructor is really smart. Half of what they said went over my head. Oh yeah, the brain's melted. Yeah, you know, like, and it happens. It happens all the time, right? And it's, it's a, a lot of it is, uh, you know, like Matt was saying with the fundamentals. It's, it's, uh, you see a lot of guys that just want to skip over it. They just want to go, and we see it all the time. How many classes in automotive training do you see labeled basic? As compared to how many classes do you see labeled advanced? Yep. Right? Because if it doesn't say advanced, nobody will take it. Yep. Because they're too smart. I already know this. I'm too smart. I sat in a freaking multimeter class for two nights in a row, and I learned something. I mean, yeah. and I'm pretty good in, up here in the Rust Belt at doing voltage drop stuff. You know, it's a daily multiple times a day I have a meter out in a set of leads and I'm doing loaded voltage drop testing. You know, I learned a new way I could use my meter, you know, on an injector circuit to be specific that I hadn't thought of before, you know, and, but 
you know, oh, oh, it's a, oh, it's a understanding your multimeter class. I don't need that. I need the advanced Pico measurement class. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which Pico is just a fast multimeter. Very fast. <laughs> <I know. laughs> the kid I took, he's like, is a graphing multimeter like an oscilloscope? I said, very similar. You know, he's 18 years old. He understood that. But, you know, everybody, else, everybody's busy trying to take the most advanced <laughs> in cylinder, you know, pressure transducer and you see it online you see it in the forums i saw one the other day the guy has a torque management calculation code and an o2 heater code and a ford focus and he's got a he's got an in-cylinder waveform posted and i'm like uh what's the fuel trim yep. <laughs> like you should like i'm pretty sure that if you use the little logic and a little bit of the scan tool you could have fixed this car without getting your wps and your pico out you probably could have fixed a car from the driver's seat, you know. Oh my god, if I have to pull out my scope on a car, your build just doubled. I hate pulling out my Pico. Like, dread it. Don't want to do it. Matter of fact, now that you mention it, I probably should pull out my WPS and charge it again because it's probably dead as a doornail and the lithium ion battery is never going to recover now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, you got, and you got a lot of guys out there that'll scope everything. You know, every single thing. And, like, I get it. Like, some things, some things it's handier for. It's handy on a Chevy pickup when I'm testing battery cables to set an oscilloscope with a five-second sweep and crank it in that sweep and then zoom in and measure my voltage drop, you know, in, in, in three spots all at the same time. Okay? So, that 15 minutes I spent there setting up, I can deal with because I'm going to get my answer in one shot. One shot, I'm going to have my answer on all the battery cables on that truck. I'm going to know if it needs a, a positive, a negative, both, neither, in one shot. So I can justify that. But, like, I don't know, like, I, we had a guy at our other shop, like, was dragging one out to test for a vent solenoid circuit code. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I got to test this back here. I go, well, first thing, use a test light. I said, and the second thing, what's the fuel tank pressure sensor read with the cap off? Oh, we go back in the car. Oh, negative two with the cap off. Well, guess what? Yep. You didn't have to get the stupid thing out. You could fix it. You could walk. You could pull the truck in, put a key on engine off, go and screw the gas cap. It's got negative two on the fuel tank pressure sensor. You're done. You're done. It's over. You know, order a fuel tank pressure sensor, in our case, a fuel pump, because, you know, it's yep. rusted to crap, and yep. get on with your life, you know? But... These guys take these advanced classes, and the the thing's got to come out for everything. And you, oh, know, you want to you want to use the flashy test, right? Uh, that's the thing. As you see somebody else, you're like, test "Wow, my test light it blinks." <laughs> yeah, <bro. laughs> I hate doing this. Like, legitimately, I do because I think this is the second time I've done this on Sean's podcast. But this is exactly the conversations um, Paul Danner and I were having, where it's like romanticizing diagnostics to the point where you feel obligated to to overcomplicate things or to to do these really almost inappropriate tests. Sure. In some cases, in some cases, genuine interest, which is good, but a lot of times it's almost a save face with if you go to post about it on a forum or ask a question. You almost have to do, feel obligated to do it to save face because if you tell them you, you did a coil swap, you're a hack. But you got just as much information as you would have with anything else. If you did the coil swap and the misfire moved, well, what what do I need to look at the squiggly lines for? Right. <laughs> I'm going to hack myself all the way to my big bank account. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll freaking move oh, you you give me a little four cylinder where the coils are sitting on oh, top and it's got a deadness the, freaking tell i'll them move the story it all day tell them the tell them the story you and i were talking about from the from the other podcast about the the no start four banger you had that you fixed and the guy was like oh you should have sold level two and compression it's like a geo metro or some shit a couple oh, weeks ago oh, the Wait, are you talking to me? The Eagle? Yeah. Uh, no, wait, was it? It was a Geo Storm. Yeah. <laughs> it was a 92 Geo Storm. No, it's a 92 Geo Storm, right? And I cranked it over. It was obvious it had no compression. It has a timing belt. 
So I cranked it over the parking lot. I got a team together, pushed it in. I got three minutes into the car. I remember, I I documented the clock. I video documented it because they were talking about, well, you got to sell all this time or whatever. And I did. I have twenty three minutes into proving that it would take a timing belt, even though it was an interference. I had twenty three minutes into the car to prove that it would take a timing belt, even though it was an interference motor. And uh, yeah, I peeled the timing cover back. Yep, belt shredded, no problem. Took the three bolts out of the valve cover that hold the thing on. Took my uh, electric ratchet, just unscrewed the freaking camshaft. All the valves are shut in each cylinder with a leak down test. They're done. 23 minutes, you know? Nice. Like, why is it got to be complicated? Like, why is it got to be like, you know, people be getting stuff out. They'd be sticking an in-cylinder pressure transducer in there, this, that, and the other thing. It's like, the thing ain't got no compression. I don't need a pressure transducer to tell me what zero PSI sounds like, <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, yep. the timing belts broke. Peeled the cover. I didn't even unscrew the cover. I went full hack, shoved a flathead in there, peeled it back. And <laughs> and said, yep, that left the chat. You know, <laughs> and they're like, "You got to ask. You got to call the customer and ask permission to tear it down." I'm like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> Ten minutes into this thing, what if they don't want it? It didn't run anyways. I'll screw the valve <laughs> cover back on and ship it." Yeah. You know? See, so that's the thing. It's like you've done the basics enough and you understand the fundamentals, how that engine, you know, is put together enough <laughs> that you know when to do something like that or when it's necessary to use the flashy, you know, high buck test or whatever yeah, you want to call it. Right. Um, because there is a time, right? There's a time where, oh, I can't, you know, pull this engine apart to see the timing chains. Sure. And it makes sense to use this tool. But that's where it is, is, uh, you know, you've done the work with the fundamentals enough to understand when and when not right. to pull that test out. Yeah, but I, you see guys going, I mean, I've seen guys waste a lot of time on something like that. You know, they'll get that pressure transducer out. They'll do all four and then they'll be like trying to stick... They'll try to stick a back probe into the crank sensor and the cam sensor. It's like, what, what are you freaking doing? Like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, this ain't hard, man. You know what turned me off? This, like, pressure transducing, advanced testing, whatever we want to call it. Sean Miller turned me off it. And <clears throat> Sean has no idea that he did it, but he did it. He does um, now. <laughs> he does now. Well, he probably doesn't listen to the podcast anyway, so it's okay. Um. Hey, ooh. he he uh he had a Cadillac come in that had an intermittent misfire or something. I don't remember quite the story, but he posted a picture of the waveform that he took with his WPS, and it had the compression hump came down. You could see the exhaust right, the exhaust come back up, and it was like a flat line. Then right at the end of the exhaust, it bumped up and then went down. And everybody was saying, oh, that's not right. There's something wrong. Like the valve is closing too early or something, da, da, da. And it was like this four-cylinder Cadillac or some weird thing. And it was like oh, new Oh, four-cylinder to... turbocharged? Yeah. And it that's was new enough. That's what we call normal to... operation. Yeah. But at the time, like this car only – this car was like maybe six months old. And nobody okay. had a known good. And so right. Sean happened to be friends with, like, the GM dealer that happened to have another one of those. And so he went down, picked it up, drove it to his shop, and scoped it, and was like, oh, you guys said tear all this stuff apart. Thank God I didn't listen. Look, this is a car that has no issues. And it was it didn't match perfectly. Like, you could overlay them, and it was dead nuts perfect. And I was like, that's yeah. it. I'm done. Like, I, I just – they have a point. And I have used the Pico WPS to find more bad GM lifters – than I'll ever care to admit. Yep. Because it works fantastic, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like the compression changes, and you're like, why is my compression changing? The RPM's not changing. I've had the AC compressor come on and change my compression, which. <laughs> but if you see the compression changing, and you go, hey, let me go turn off my AC compressor, and it's already off, and you're going, hey, I'm I'm getting 20 psi of compression difference. Is this thing's running? Like, there's something wrong. Like, that's not possible. Oh, well, it's got a. Is this a DOD cylinder? Yep. Okay. It's got a lifter that's failing. Like, no big deal. But most of the time, God, I hate pulling mine out. Yeah, I try to avoid it at all times. The, the quite only honestly. thing I wish I could get a Pico with a screen built into it just for relative compression testing. That'd be handy. 
Yeah, because when I go to a Diag and it's a misfire, and they've thrown coils, injectors, spark plugs, more coils, more spark plugs, more injectors, maybe a timing chain, heads, and they're like, oh, it's still going to miss. I, I don't care. First thing I do is relative compression, and I hate pulling out my scope to do it. Um, I have a U-scope. I just don't like doing it on the U-scope because the screen's so small. Yeah, it's hard to make judgments on the <clears throat> U-scope screen. It, it for is. For sure. Uh, and I can't give a really cool printout with bar graphs on it when it fails to the customer, like in the Pico Diagnostics. Like, yeah, I know you guys said you took the heads off, and but uh, you screwed something up because it's got it's low broke. compression on three cylinders. Here you go. Have a good day. Bye. Like, Yeah, it depends go. on the shop for me. If it's like a, most of the time, I can hear it. And so depending on the shop, I'm like, there you guys go. Some places they want the printout, they want all that stuff, but sometimes it's just crank it and listen, and there you go. I'm on with my day. Mine have never been bad enough where I could hear it and just be like, really? You called me out for this? I'd probably be called a lot of names because I would probably make fun of the tech at that point because I'd be like, <laughs> how do you call yourself a professional and you can't hear this? Boy, like, that would I, be- I feel like I have that weekly on something. Yeah, where the answer was obvious. Yeah, like like extremely obvious, like you you did the bumped you did the bumped evaluation rate at the door because you're gonna have a while into this car, and you're eight minutes into it and you've already like you're holding the problem in your hand. You're like, uh-huh. what was the problem here? <laughs> like, what happened? Where could have this gone south? I guarantee you, if they would have typed this into Identifix, it would have like if they would have just followed the list, they would have fixed this by accident. But yeah, it, it happens. The last thing I'd like to talk about for billing for Diag, because it's getting late, and Sean's going to hate editing this, um, is when not to bill for Diag. Because I think far too often we will bill for stuff that we shouldn't. And I don't mean like you run a test, you legitimately thought that was a good, a good test, right? Like, oh, fuel pressure's low on this car. I'm going to... You know, or I think fuel pressure is low because my fuel trims are all lean, right? So hey, I'm gonna run a fuel pressure and volume test, and it passes. And you're like, oh, how did I misread the data, right? Like, okay, that's fine. But if you get a new car in and it has a new system, I don't think you should charge somebody to sit there and read service information for two hours on how the system works, because one. That system's probably based off another system that you should be able to relate it to rather quickly. And two, if you need to spend that much time reading on it, I don't I don't know how you're actually gonna properly test it if you really if it's broken and you've never seen a working one. Um I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts? But don't you run into that all the time, working in body shops and stuff like that? Oh, I work on twenty three cars all the time and and there's times when I'm like, I have no idea what this system is. And so I will go home and read it and I will leave, right? Like I just tell them, hey, I don't know how this works. I'm leaving. Um, prime example, I have a 2014 Honda CRV that has aftermarket parking sensors installed. It's a factory add on parking sensors. They don't work. I'm like, we'll call the customer and tell him if he leaves it for a couple days, I'll figure out how this add on system works. Because it's not a normal Honda parking system, and I've never seen it. And then maybe I can fix it. No lie, they called the customer. The customer's like, oh, they haven't worked in years. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, sweet. So I don't have to worry about how they work. But yeah, I mean, I will go home and read something. And, and most of the times I'll find out like, oh, this Chrysler air suspension works a lot like the Mercedes air suspension. Or this new EVAP system is nothing but a relabeled NVLDP pump, and it's going to fail all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Like, nobody's really reinventing the wheel in our industry anymore. Like, I'd say it's been there, done that, been tried. Might have a new name, slightly different way it functions, but we've probably tested it at some point. And I don't mind going home and reading, but I don't charge for it, right? Like, it's not... Because if that customer went to the dealer, guess what that professional tech has? Training on that system. So to me, if I really want to be a professional and I really want to be the best I could be in the industry, I need to know how the system works and operates. 
and there's some systems I just don't test anymore. Like I suck at transmissions. You know what I don't do? I don't try to diagnose 10 speed transmission problems. <laughs> Why? There's too many parts in them. I don't care. Take it to the training shop. That's what they do. Um, but now if the training shop calls me and says, Hey, we got this 10 speed. We we're pretty sure it's an electrical issue. Can you come down and test it? Sure. No problems. Right. But I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, yeah, well, the third gear clutch isn't engaging right, and the second drum has got a crack in it. We can tell that by – no, screw that. That's not my job, right? But my point is is that, like, I will waste the time and not charge to read on a system. Like, I pull up TSBs and read them just to know what problems are. Why? Because if I go to a Diag and I'm like, man, that really sounds like a TSB I read – and I can thumb through because now I have a car, right? And go, oh, yep, that was a TSB I read. Let me read it again. Oh, okay. I'm aware. I know. What's it help? It helps me get in, get out, and get on my way. Because how do I make money? Get in, get out, get on my way, right? I'm getting paid at least my minimum hour, whether it takes me five minutes or it takes me an hour. How do I make more money? I need to make it take five minutes. How do I make it take five minutes? I waste time at night reading TSBs and scrolling through Identifix. So, as far as reading goes, like, yeah, I, I see what you mean. And I'll, I'll give you an example that I think that uh, I can relate, we can we can relate this to. So, I had a, it's actually an older Dodge. It was a 2013 <laughs> Dodge in the other day. Um, customer complaint, four-wheel drive and op. Other shop told them, front wheel spin on the lift, your four-wheel drive works fine. I'm like, whatever. So, I back it in the snow. Hit the gas, spin the tires. Guy's right. His four-wheel drive doesn't work. Things going into four-wheel drive, all this, that, and the other thing. Get in and scan it for codes. Has a transfer case clutch overheat code. I go, interesting. Clutch. Okay. And because it's got this thing on Dodge, it says four-wheel lock, right? When we say four-wheel lock, right, we think like, you know, my 07 F250 where I yanked the lever back and that sucker was in four-wheel drive like mechanically connected, no clutch. Well, you know, turns out after five minutes of reading, all that, that code, that over temp code only generates when the rear wheels spin faster than the front. And there is no locking mechanism. It's a pulse width modulated clutch pack that's in the transfer case. That's all it's got. So that level of reading, sure, right? Five, 10 minutes to understand how something works so you can understand what you're dealing with. I'm cool with that on the first, on the customer's initial diagnostic charge. Now, something that's like way out there, like uh, uh, the other day I had to, I had to put the GM uh, cruise control, the GM aftermarket parts cruise control kit in a Chevy cruise, go figure. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, how do I, who do I call? What do I do? The customer had already installed the parts. You know what I mean? I never didn't have the original box. No, I, I figured that out at home. I got the information and stuff from the customer. I figured it out on my own time, what I needed to do. And then they got charged for normal programming. You know what I mean? So yeah, I can see, I can see both sides to that. There's gotta be, you know, and it's, I think too, you got to limit that because some guys will read way beyond what they need to know to actually figure the problem out, right? Like that Dodge, that Dodge had like 14 pages on the transfer case. I got to paragraph three. I was like, oh, it's freaking pulse with modulated clutch pack. It sets the code when the rear wheels spin faster than the front. Uh, okay, I'm going to pull the drain plug and smell the fluid. And, you know, it was stripper glitter. And I'm done. You know what I mean? I didn't have to read the other 13 pages on how that transfer case worked. You know? So I think that I think that kind of goes two ways. Like, I don't have a problem with reading description and operation, you know, in a basic form. But if I want to know engineering level, like if I want to read the whole article and that's 26 pages, I ain't going to build a customer to read 26 pages and take notes on it. You know what I mean? That's That's not going to happen. Yeah. So. It's probably a whole different episode, this whole situation, because we're starting to kind of get into a gray area of, you know, inspection analysis time versus training. Right. 
and where where does it shift yeah, from one to the, the other? And, accepted level of training. Yeah, we're, we're going to have Sorites paradox here in no time. That wh- when does it become? <laughs> I know does he does go, that all the time. <laughs> what? Sorites yeah, paradox. You always like, you always that, name Savador's some dog. You always name like some Greek god and paradox and something <laughs> or whatever. I don't even know what Sorites was. Come on, man. Back in um, Zeus and Hades were making out with yeah. Cleopatra. Um, um, Sorites Sorites paradox is like a. It's really a um, thought experiment of um, when does a, how many grain is how many grains of sand does it take to make a heap. Okay. You know, when when does a when does a it's pile of sand become a heap? Or when yeah. does a, a a mountain transition to a valley or something like that? It's 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 just a thought experiment bringing up like issues of vagueness. So, um yeah, it's uh, sometimes they call it the I think they call it like the heap or this the heap paradox or the heap Riddle See, or something like that. Now that you explained it, the dumb people, your your statement now makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> have to, we're, I'm gonna start calling Matt Splaining. <laughs> yeah. yeah right. I need this Matt Splain to me. <laughs> yeah. Can you explain it at Matt's level? He drives yeah. his cars. So at some point, right, it goes from analysis inspection to training, and then you have this situation of where. There's certain types of individuals. They will take it home, and they they gotta know, and they're not getting paid for that. And you know, ownership has to kind of recognize this, and it would it would be nice if they would recognize it and attach value to it. Some and do. Whether, whatever that may mean, taco right? For lunch today. Right. There's <laughs> a lot of stuff. There's a lot of ways to compensate, right? So. This isn't just like, oh wow, you stayed up and read about that. Here's here's two hundred bucks. I don't mean it. That could certainly be something, but there's many different ways, and the shop should also profit as well. And then the others are, when they go home, home home times home time. They're not being compensated to do that research. They're only going to do that at work and. There is a certain level of value to it, but now we get into like you're saying, do they need to read all 13 pages to diagnose the vehicle? You know what I mean? And then you got this quandary again of, is it, how much benefit is it there to the shop or the tech to read through that entire thing to go diagnose this or, you know, inspect and diagnose this vehicle? And then the next time, if he read, he or she read all 13 pages. Are they that much more prepared for the next one coming in? And the next one comes in eight months from now. Right. So it's almost like, will everyone just be freaking honest with each other? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I probably yeah. didn't need to read all 13 pages, boss. Yeah. Okay. You know, well, but you did go home and read 13 pages on your own time. That's freaking awesome. And I appreciate that. And down the road, something nice happens, whatever that, right. ha- whatever that may sure. be that. So we could end up at a whole different uh, discussion about it, but I, I think it's just honesty and awareness on everybody's part. Like it says, how does this machine all work? And I don't, I'm not even talking about the car, the shop. How does this machine, all these moving parts work together to generate properly pr- repaired vehicles that, is profitable for everybody. Right. Yeah, that's that's huge. The, the the best example I could give of a situation where I spent way too much time reading. <clears throat> it was a Jeep Rubicon that had front and rear electronic lockers, front locking or sorry, front disconnectable sway bar. Some like rock crawler package they sell. You people up north are probably used to this thing. I'd never seen one. This thing got slammed in the left rear, bent the frame, and bent the axle housing. The axle housing is on like, as an assembly, was on back order. So they got just the housing, and then they got a new axle for the one side, and then rebuilt everything. Got it done. 
Of course, the thing is no ADOS, right? Because it's a rock crawler, so who has, like, ADOS? He said, hey, it's got this really weird light on dash. Not sure if it should be there or not. Can you come tell us if it should be there? And I'm like, eh, all right, whatever. Come down. I was going out and do stuff. Anyway, so I scanned the car with Y-Tech, and I noticed that the, the four-wheel drive lock low is stuck on. And I thought, that's really weird. Maybe it's just the way it's supposed to be. Maybe it's not. I don't know. So I ended up calling uh, Robert LaCrosse because he worked at Chrysler forever, and he his son works for Chrysler. So, you know, if you got to call somebody, I'm like, hey, where would I find the information to read about what light should be on, shouldn't be on? I've never seen one of these. I bet you we spent an hour on the phone going through the vehicle, and the fix was, you're going to laugh at this. I read that, it, hey, it has to automatically come out of this electronically lock mode at 31 mile an hour due to like safety concerns and i couldn't get it to manually unlock by hitting the button like you'd hit it you'd hear and then it, the light would go off and then it'd go and the light would come back on i'm like well what the hell i didn't tell it to lock and there was something where it wasn't quite synced up right but when i forced it to unlock by driving it down the road Dude, it sounded like a shotgun went off. <laughs> Boom! And I think there was some kind of spline not quite lined up. <laughs> and and I swear to God, I was like, oh, I just broke it. Like, I really thought I broke it. And so the shop next to the shop, there's this giant sand pit. And so I just put it in four low and went in there. And I was like, no. I was like, hey, it all still works. And it would lock, unlock, two-wheel drive. Had to call somebody to come get me out of the sand pit because I still got stuck in two-wheel drive. <laughs> it was one of those times where I probably read for an hour and a half, and the shop's like, you've been here forever. I, I don't even want to know what this is going to cost me. And I'm like, honestly, 80% of it was me learning how the system works. I, I think I charged them like an hour of my time out of like the two hours I was there because I was like, this is fair. It's not your fault that I had no clue how an electronic locker system worked because <laughs> I never dealt with one, right? right. Like it's, it's Florida. We have no snow. We have no mountains. We barely have hills. Like electronic lockers aren't, aren't used down here very often. So, and if they are, it's used by some hillbilly who lives out in the woods and wants his electronic <laughs> locker. And he's probably taking it out anyway and putting a real locker in there so he doesn't get stuck when he's hunting his uh, dog deer that we have down here. <laughs> is Sandpit Floridian for beach? No, no, <laughs> no, it is. no. I think they have like inland. They have like actual areas that are yeah. super sandy and like a bowl. Like yeah, they so have legit sand pits. You like can real ones. you can huh. you can yeah, dig I down seen... like th- two three feet and hit like beach sand. I think I seen one huh. at Davenport one time. I was like, holy moly, look at the size of that sand pit. Yeah. And then there was another lake. Yeah. But yeah. We do not have those up here. Yeah. It's it's all clay. You just got cocaine that covers the ground at like four foot deep sections at a time. (laughs) Also that. (laughs) You guys should sell your snow. Did you know that you can order (laughs) snow and send it to somebody? What? (laughs) There's a website. You Hit me up. Order, My email is yeah, ST. <laughs> you can order snow. Does it have to be white? Send it to somebody's house. <laughs> There's a company that boxes snow up without what I'm assuming must be in a cooler with dry ice. You can order it in 50 pound increments or 20 pound increments. I got to Google this. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm going to be it. rich. <laughs> <laughs> Century I got it. I, come. I swear I got it. Right you still here. don't have one, you cheapskate. It's ship called snowyo.com. Yeah. <laughs> Buy snow and ship it to your friends and family. <laughs> yeah, look at this. 20, 20 pounds of pounds real snow. Blizzard in a box. How okay. much is 50 pounds of snow? $300. 50 pounds. Oh. Freaking 50 pounds. It's 300 bucks. No, this uh 20 pounds is $300. 20 pounds is $300? <laughs> yeah, oh it comes God. It comes in a big cube. Well, oh, come yeah, this there's a, sounds like somebody's retiring. There's a picture of a little kid. He's making a snowman. And there's grass out there. He's oh yeah, melting in the hot floor. Oh yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> this is ridiculous. My Olaf would melt before I even got him assembled. What are we doing trying to fix these super complex cars where we could be scamming people with snow? Oh, <laughs> you imagine? Dang it. You don't even have to warranty it. Like it melts. <laughs> That's <what> it does. <laughs> <laughs> it's the perfect. <laughs> How much could you possibly spend shipping snow? 
I don't know, 50 pounds. We're going to find out. To ship. Yeah, I'm about to find out. I'm going to send stuff. I'm going to send a package right to St. Cloud as soon as possible. <laughs> My kids will love, love you. <laughs> They'll be making Olaf in your driveway. It'll be the shortest live Olaf you've ever seen. 18 minutes <laughs> down, the, down the gutter. Uh, is all that Minnesota snow yellow? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, on an update, since I bitched about my century last time I was here, um, I will tell you that I like the tool some days. Thought about pulling out my 9mm 1911 and putting about 10 holes through the fucking screen the other day. Um, you know how Windows, when it updates, it does the blue screen like, hey, we're updating your Windows, please wait. It sat at 100% of update status for 4 hours and 27 minutes Jesus. i called merrick and i'm like hey merrick what do i do oh just leave it alone how long merrick until it starts what happens if it doesn't start call me tomorrow if it doesn't start we'll work on it then call Thanks, me tomorrow. merrick <laughs> yep because it had some stupid big service pack to do and so it just sat there and updated and updated and updated and updated like but it's at 100 percent. i'm like how long can it really that seems more like a nissan thing yeah, it's Zentry. Zentry's just bad, but it's only the Windows updates on the tool. Well, Nissan would kind of do that, right? You're programming something, it would stay. Yeah, and not but not move for... and not move and not move and then. Yeah, I just had something else do that the other day. It sat at seven percent for a very long time, and it went from seven to a hundred in something under five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> like it sat at seven percent for like thirty freaking minutes. If I have a bar like that, I'll kind of move my mouse right to the edge of the bar. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, is it moving? Judge it's moving or not? <laughs> you know what I've learned? It, you're going to laugh after all these years. You know what I've learned? I just play Call of Duty, and every once in a while I just glance over. If it doesn't say complete, I just play another round of Call of Duty. Like, I don't even care anymore. <laughs> I did a Nissan today. It said 25 minutes. I can tell you, I played five rounds of Team Deathmatch before that 25 minutes was up. And I got one nuke in those five rounds, so I was pretty thrilled. I've learned really crappy people play in the middle of the afternoon. So I, I'm, uh, like, I'm like Call of Duty. I God. hate Nissans, man, because those those fans come on and they just let you know that this thing you've just turned this computer into a brick. I'm always like the fans come on. I'm like, all right, see you on the other side, little buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that must be like pull a, through. That must be a Nears thing because I don't hear the fans run with my consult. I used consult on an infinity and the fans came on. No, no, no. I mean like a real consult, not the fake J Box. Oh, yeah, consult. no, I have fake I have fake. Yeah. 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 The fans come on and it's like, well, we'll see how this goes. And sometimes they run for a really long time and you're like, freaking, uh oh. <laughs> Is this gonna be all right? But they always seem to come through somehow. <laughs> that must be why I see on a bunch of pages you guys talk about pulling the fan relay. I'm like, why do you pull the fan relay? So even when you program a PCM that's offline, the fans don't run. Yeah. Yeah. Next time I what? do one, I'm gonna videotape that some bitch. What is this black magic? It's called yeah. a VI three, I guess. I don't know. I mean, are you talking about like a Titan that's got a belt driven fan? <laughs> no, I did a uh <laughs> Oh, I did a Q50 at the Ford dealer, and it had the twin turbo V6. It comes out of the GTR, and there's a TSB for some like pedal pressure code, and you got to update the ECM. <laughs> and uh, so I went down and I updated it, and the fans kicked on for like a millisecond. It's like, Boo! and I was like, oh, here we are. We're back to programming, and it beeps them once, like a millisecond. Really? Yeah. Huh? That's I never had a run. Man, every time I program an Nissan, it if it takes a half hour, it that's how long the fans run. Well, I guess that's why you got to have that top dot ninety amp charger hooked up. You're going to test to make sure that sucker is going to last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They make it. They they've always. Sean, you're telling it, me your but... fans run the whole time you're programming a Nissan. Well, see, I I honestly rarely do PCMs. It's all TCMs, and they don't run there because. No. But I I know that I've done them where the fans have kicked on. And, like, run, like, almost the whole time it's programming. Oh, well, for sure. As long as the PCM's offline, the the IPDM's just like, all right, let's go. But, yeah, yeah. Like, 
Yeah, you can I, unhook I get, a Nissan PCM and the fans will run just by. Oh yeah, because every time I go to a Nissan No Start and I turn the key on and I hear. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, the PCM's offline. Hey, you need a PCM. Like, I don't even test powers your garden anymore. Just get a PCM. Why? Because I know it needs a PCM. I'll check my next one because I, I have the VI2 right. in the console, so we'll see. Yeah. My VI2's been on loan for like eight months to a locksmith friend of mine. He's going to be really upset when he gets my phone call tomorrow that I need it back because <laughs> I can't get another Nissan interface for my brother, so I need mine back. Mm. Yeah, that's the one I couldn't double either. I got my guy going and found just about everything, but not that. <laughs> I'm I'm having a hard time finding another uh, VCI three. Yeah, I don't have I one got of those my new either. MDI, I ordered an MDI two a month ago and it came in the mail. What? Yep. Yep. I think Isaac said he had a bunch of them. What? Really? VCM threes or MDI twos? I thought MDI twos. Oh yeah, they, they're threes, back in I... stock. Okay. They're they're different. My logo looks different on my new one than my old one, so I thought Bosch sent me a China clone. <laughs> uh, maybe Bosch did send me a China clone. Uh, <laughs> it does they look seem to work pretty good. <laughs> Everybody blames TechLine Connect, anyways. <laughs> oh my god, that'd be epic. Bosch is buying the clones and selling them, dude. So that my would be, that would be perfect. <laughs> you imagine being the. Oh my gosh, you imagine being the tech director the Chinese guys at like, Bosch and going on like Alibaba.com and buying all these <laughs> <laughs> uh, there and just, just shipping them back out. Right? Because that, that's Chinese textbook guy. clone, right? Oh, the label looks a little bit different. Yeah, that's because it was made in China. <laughs> Can you imagine being the China guy, though, that getting the order? Hey, guess what, Bosch? We're famous! I've got 10,000 units sold! <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. I'll guarantee it. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine? I yeah, uh, you couldn't get anything for a while. I tried to order like three or four tools and I go, Well, I guess it's cardiac for life over here for a little while, but maybe I'll look into some stuff again. Yeah, the MDI twos, um, they have a different number for them now, which is actually how I ended up getting it. So they have the old number and they have this new number. And I'm like, I'm gonna order this new number. It's, it's Oh, it's it definitely a clone. <laughs> Yeah. It was from acdelco.com and it, and Bosch charged me the full like 1700 or whatever it was, the 900 bucks or something. I'm going to order one. I'm going to order one for uh $235. And we're going to do a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're to take them. Wait till it's got the same poor fellow's signature on the inside of the thing. Or <laughs> QC passed is like the identical number or something. <laughs> We all have the same cereal, just nobody's ordered more than one, so Bosch, yeah. you know. Nobody yeah. Knows <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Cool guys. Well did we uh did we cover it? Did we uh, did we get there? I hope so. I, hope right. so. God. Yeah, I, don't know I think we just fixed again. the entire profession now. Perfect. <laughs> Charging diagnostics good. appropriately. I, well, I think it would be fun if you want. We should we should really discuss uh, the what what was that paradigm shift thing about <laughs> psoriasis <laughs> or something? Psoriasis yeah. <laughs> paradox. <laughs> how many how many grains of rice do we have to have before it becomes a bowl? Like yep. yeah, that's uh, that's exactly what it is. Yep. <laughs> but we should really it would be fun to discuss like where the where we find the line between training. And not training. And a hobby. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that gets difficult sometimes. I, you know. I refuse to have hobbies as my cars anymore just because I get so pissed off at them all day. I'm like, I'm not coming home to work on another shit box that I customized and broke. <laughs> like Dusty Harrison, man, that poor soul has been trying to get his Audi to like 900 horsepower. And every time he like blows out the trans and I'm like, dude. I, I applaud you for all the effort you've put into that car, but good God almighty, sir. Like, you and trainees don't go well together. Yeah, and, like, what's the big deal? 900 horsepower. My truck's got 450, and all I did was sign the paperwork. Like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, the effort, the smiles per gallon ain't adding up here. I guarantee you I'm just as happy. I guarantee you I'm just as happy throttle jockey in my power stroke as he is his Audi that's broke all the time. Maybe happier. 
You know, <laughs> thousand foot pounds of torque. It's freaking yeah. You, you know, some kid tries to pass you in some eighty seven Camaro and you put him on the trailer. How can you not be happy when you're in an eighty four hundred pound pickup <laughs> truck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's he getting all his smiles from over break re breaking his Audi fifty times? I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't know the guy's wicked good at tuning and figuring that crap out. Like he's done stuff that you shouldn't do to a car, so it's kinda cool to watch him build it, but Ugh. It's not my hobby anymore. Okay, that's gonna do it for tonight's episode. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Brian, for joining me on the show today. I really appreciate it. Another great discussion. Uh, really good to talk to these guys. Hopefully you enjoyed that as well. I'd like to thank everybody out there for listening to the show and all the feedback that I've been getting. Always appreciate that. But with that out of the way, let's all get out there. Start fixing the world one car at a time.